from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. We believe enterprise applications are undergoing a profound change. By next year, highly capable agentic systems will emerge to create and alter the way organize, organizations think about their backend systems, their data platforms, and their user interfaces. The extent of the transformation, we believe, will be more impactful to the application stack than were the changes brought about by innovation seen during the modern GUI, web, cloud, and mobile eras. While many people are talking about agents, very few in our view have thought deeply about the potential of deploying and orchestrating armies of hundreds or thousands of agents to more fully automate enterprises. These capabilities are likely to come from application vendors, data platform providers, the cloud players, and a select few innovators. It's a journey, and we don't really know the productivity impact. It's most likely to affect white collar productivity in a way that mass production affected labor productivity. Eventually, intelligent agent-based systems, we think, will be able to complete routine business processes with five to 10x fewer headcount than is required today. Hello and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I build on our previous work and dig deeper into agentic systems and specifically how intelligent automation will dramatically alter the way applications are built, data is accessed, and businesses operate. Let's start with a view of today's state of enterprise applications. Now, as we've previously discussed, today's applications are a collection of bespoke systems that have data, business logic, and as you see here, associated metadata locked inside proprietary platforms. Commercial applications generally address narrow business challenges and connections to data in these systems is enabled by creating a separate data platform that serves as the historical version of the truth. In operationalizing the insights from this data is an asynchronous process that falls short of industry promises to create a real-time 360 degree view of the business. Now, moreover, the compartmentalized nature of today's systems, while perhaps adequately serving individual departments like finance, R&D, sales, human resources, or logistics, constricts our ability to drive end-to-end -end automation within an enterprise and across an ecosystem. Now, as shown in this example, loosely connected systems make it difficult to view the state of the business in real time. We've essentially created software-defined departments and have work to do to build a highly automated enterprise. George, please add some color to these two pictures before we dig more deeply into the future of enterprise apps and the real impact of AI. So we've been trying to bridge these islands of automation for decades. There's an alphabet soup of acronyms like enterprise application integration, uh, message-oriented middleware, web services, even microservices, but they were all hard to maintain and evolve because they were too low level. They were translating between applications that spoke fundamentally different languages. And so they were brittle and they only reached, you know, a portion of the application estate. Great, thank you for that. So let's let's carry on. So we see the potential of systems with multiple agents to attack the islands of automation problems that we're showing here. We're gonna show you a more full picture in a moment, but we envision agents that have authority and access to, uh, to work with human supervision toward a set of outcomes that are measured by some of the same KPIs we have in our dashboards today. Agents, we think, will work in a coalition with other agents and respond to actions and changes in the market, all while optimizing for a top-level business goal such as customer satisfaction or market share or profitability or growth or whatever the key metric and goal is. Now, these agents will complement and augment existing automated processes. Importantly, they'll learn from these existing systems and also by observing human actions and they'll do things that can't necessarily be hand coded. So as such, we see an entirely new stack forming on top of today's existing systems. 
We don't see this as a rip and replace. That's not gonna work, but rather an evolution that will take place over the next five to 10 years. And we believe those firms which can take advantage of the transformation will radically improve their productivity by deploying multiple agents that can work together, driving AI native processes that will disrupt businesses who don't respond. Now here's a view of what the new stack will look like. We're gonna walk you through this, uh, this, this picture and the salient aspects of the diagram, but as a setup, let's think about four critical pieces. First is the connection to existing operational apps and backend analytics systems. Next, think about the data platform architecture that, that we believe will become increasingly abstracted. And then on top of that is a, a, a layer that is a to be created layer that harmonizes all the disparate data elements in the enterprise such that the data definitions are consistent, trusted, shareable, and of course, governed. And then next is the ability to deploy, manage, orchestrate, and optimize multiple agents, which is shown here in the upper right, that finally are guided by the business metrics shown in the upper left based on top-down goals. So George, this is think of this as a bottom-up, top-down model of the enterprise that we believe will dramatically improve productivity and alter the application landscape. Your thoughts? This is a profound transition for the industry. It's really unlike any we've seen before because it affects both the demand for the software through UI innovations that make applications accessible in, in new and different contexts, but it also radically changes the productivity of every aspect of the software development lifecycle. Now, we've had top-down intergalactic approaches trying to integrate the enterprise. They've never succeeded. One example was enterprise data models that were too difficult for in-house developers. So that's how we had off-the-shelf commercial applications. But there were bottom-up approaches trying to model everything, say, in microservices, but that created a Tower of Babel that we only partially kind of reconciled downstream with bringing the data into a data lake or the modern data stack. Um, but so again, all these approaches resulted in islands of automation or analytics that spoke different languages. Now, agents, which are the next iteration of large language models, you might think of them as large action models, they can help bridge these islands by helping them work together because the agents eventually from different vendors that might exist in, in different applications today, we'll be able to talk to each other in essentially in English um, when we have the proper, proper scaffolding in place. So not only will agents be able to talk together in this common language, they'll be able to learn what's going on in the business by observing the breadcrumbs of business activities, all the things that can't be explicitly coded. So that's the bottom-up approach that wasn't technologically possible before. All right, let's walk through and unpack the key components of that stack that we just showed you. And we're gonna start by drilling into the existing operational systems as shown here. We're looking at examples including Salesforce and its MuleSoft asset, Microsoft's Power Platform, and automation specialists UiPath and Salonis as just a few of the examples of the firms that, that we see pursuing this vision. So George, please explain the importance of connecting to these legacy systems. How will it be accomplished and the nuance that existing application vendors are working to expand their TAM, they're protecting their base, they're trying to add more value, while at the same time, you have companies that aspire to build horizontal capabilities like a UiPath across multiple applications, and that they're trying to pursue this vision as well. So it's important to keep in mind that, like all transitions, we don't sweep aside all that came before. These technologies have to coexist with and build on the legacy enterprise software stack that so many decades of investment has, has gone into. And to do that, we need to start with these two-way connectors so that agents can be aware of what's going on in the business by talking to existing systems. And the reason I say two-way connectors is they're going to have to perform transactions to update what's in the existing systems of record that today are, are mostly um, islands. So for example, you might have the idiosyncrasies of, of product returns 
may be too hard to hand code, but an agent that's a, assisting a customer service rep talking to a customer about returning a product will need to talk to an order management system, an inventory system, a logistics system, et cetera. And that happens by one or more agents interacting with these connectors that will interrogate and or transact with these backend systems. Now, at first, it'll only really be one agent that will know how to talk to these different systems because they'll have to be a little bit trained or hard-coded on how to connect. But eventually, you'll have agents that are more adaptable and they'll be able to talk to and call on each other. So, but all of the work of the enterprise currently getting done with existing applications will be these critical building blocks that agents extend. So without the connectors, you can't get started. All right, so great. So next, let's drill into the data layer in the stack. Uh, we've covered Databricks and Snowflake extensively and the many changes that are occurring in that market, specifically the shifting point of control from the DBMS to the governance layer. We've talked about that a lot. It's becoming the governance layer, becoming more open, uh, but the value sands are shifting further up the stack into the application layer. And there's a lot to be sorted out here as we sh show those two leaders, plus some other new entrants like Starburst, which has taken a federated or data meshy type approach, and some existing application vendors like Salesforce with its data cloud and Microsoft building abstractions across its data estate and unifying its metadata and governance model. And of, of course, Google and AWS are gonna be participating as well. But the, the five names shown here are actively making moves in this space. George, what's your perspective on what's happening at the data layer? And how do you see this playing out in the context of agentic systems? So the, the data layer is the historical source of truth for the enterprise. That's, that's its role. It captures in one logical place, what has happened, why it happened, what will happen, and even what should happen. In other words, this is the context that guides agents um, and their activity. And that's partly why the move from a DBMS-centric to a metadata-centric approach to the data platform is so important, because that's what allows multiple compute engines or tools to access the analytic data estate at any one time. Um, today, you know, those different engines might be machine learning tools or training your own LLM, but in the future, it's having multiple agents talking to this data. That's why you had to get past the bottleneck of one DBMS controlling access. Now, um, today's data platform is, is unfinished because all the data that it pools has been stripped of all the context and meaning that was captured in the apps or these islands of automation. And that's what brings us to the next next layer. Okay, thank you, George. Let's keep moving up the stack and focus on what is sometimes called the semantic layer. Uh, we're also referring to it here as the harmonized data layer, layer. This is a big missing piece today where we're trying to rationalize all the complexity around data pipelines and data products and multiple data types bolted on metadata and governance models, metrics layers that all ultimately feed analytic applications. And we want to bring the data together in a way that speaks a common language of the business and is trusted so that agents can take action um, on top of that data. Um, and what we show here as well, George, you show transactions. It really ties back to the work we did early last year with Uber and our vision of Uber for the enterprise. George, your chart shows firms coming at this from two different directions. One is the data semantics that we're seeing emerge from Salesforce with customer 360. And the second is the metrics layer, companies like AtScale and DBT and Databricks with Lakehouse Intelligence using um, that example. How do you see this piece of the mosaic evolving? So the two approaches you mentioned, like customers 360, which also goes along with like supply chain 360, operations 360, and then metric layers, they're two sides of the same coin. They're trying to connect what seems like disparate data so that they describe the same thing as part of our um, theme of 
moving from strings of data to people, places, and things that are meaningful to the business. In the case of customer 360, you could understand a customer journey, their preferences. Um, with metrics, you're describing all the elements for measuring business KPIs, such as bookings, billings, and revenue. Again, getting away from strings. But this, each of those two approaches only solves part of the problem of getting to people, places, things, and activities. These standardize the language around things or simple measures. They don't standardize and harmonize the activities or business processes that link and span all these things. That's a much harder problem. That's the province of what relational AI, enterprise web, Palantir, Salonis, each coming at the problem from a different angle are trying to solve. Now, it's inaccurate to say that the data platform will no longer be important in the age of AI. Some of the pioneers of the modern data stack, such as Tristan Handy of DBT Labs, have written about how interest and valuation from the investment investment community has moved on from the data platform. But I think there's a, a contrary uh, point of view, which is AI will just put much more pressure on the data platform to innovate so that it can harmonize first the analytic data and then eventually the processes and the operational apps. And agents will be so much more powerful and productive when they can navigate across this data and application estate when they have one uniform map of the world and what's going on. Now, what's not clear yet is whether today's data platform vendors will be the source of the harmonization technology or a new wave of companies that we just mentioned. Okay, great. Um, let's keep going um, north up the stack into what may emerge as one of the more valuable pieces of real estate in the picture, the agent operations here in the upper right corner. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here, but this is where the vision becomes reality. New tooling has to be established to make this real. And importantly, we're not talking, we're not taking humans out of the equation. Rather, we're enabling agents to work together to understand the business objectives, adjust plans as the business evolves, and work together to make humans and organizations dramatically more productive by presenting different alternatives and what ifs. George, you're showing several companies on this chart, if you would bring that back up, like Salesforce, Palantir, Salonis, and Microsoft as examples of firms pursuing this capability. What is the fundamental requirement at this layer of the stack and, and how do you see it evolving? So the, the shiny new toy um, next year that everyone's gonna be talking about are our, our agents. This is sort of the reincarnation of LLMs from large language models to large action models, one way of thinking about it. But everyone's been talking about individual agents. That's like talking about individual microservices. They, they only become really effective when they work in conjunction with other agents to accomplish more sophisticated compound tasks, which we call business processes, building on what came before. And to do that, they need an agent control framework. That is part of the new application model or scaffolding that's emerging. We used to have an application that mo model that existed really in three logical tiers. There was a data model, which was stored in the DBMS application logic, which was its own sort of separate tier, an UI or presentation tier. And, and that's what gave us the islands of automation because each was its own stovepipe even when we got to the microservice era. But this new model, and we're still trying to understand the outlines, when it matures, this new model is what will allow agents to talk to each other across applications and from different vendors. So you design a tree of metrics, what's in the upper left quarter. This is at the very top, the North Star objectives, um, such as we want to grow the business or we want to grow our ecosystem and the value of the ecosystem. So we're not just looking at financial metrics. Then below that are all the components that drive or influence those North Star metrics. And this tree of, me of metrics metaphorically measures and represents a model of how the business runs. And then next to that on the right, there's this org chart of all the specialized metrics and their responsibilities. Each agent has specialized expertise, but unlike microservices, they have more intelligence. 
to figure out how to accomplish a task beyond what's explicitly specified, how to do product returns. And they get better over time, one, by measuring their performance against the outcomes that are in the metric tree, customer satisfaction, cost to serve, by observing their human supervisors and by capturing the expertise of domain experts who edit the plans that they generate. This is why this is so very different from procedural code that we've used for decades, because now we can capture tacit knowledge and we can capture the 80% of enterprise activity and processes that you just could not specify top down in some Newtonian mechanical set of rules. All right, good. So we've come full circle here. Let's bring up uh, the next picture and summarize our key takeaways. This is what we showed you up top. This, the evolutionary part of the system is, it, it is built on top of existing cloud and on-prem systems with deep connections into the critical operational applications as well as the historical systems of analytic truth. And a unified and cogent metadata model must emerge from a combination of existing data platforms and a model that ties together multiple data estates into a single federated data management system. And then a layer evolves above that that harmonizes the data and business logic, as well as the process definitions that are defined by the business. And a highly valuable framework must be built with R&D to orchestrate multiple agents that are working together toward a business outcome defined by those goals that George was talking about in the upper left. The progress toward those goals is measured by KPIs that comprise the OKRs, the objectives and, and, and key results of the business that can be fine-tuned and adjusted as business conditions change. George, does that capture the essence of the future of intelligent enterprise data apps as we see them today? How do you see it evolving? And what's the time frame to make this real? So on the time frame, Salesforce is most likely to be the first, at least to announce an army of agents and a framework to, to make it work. We believe next month at Dreamforce, we believe Microsoft will likely be the second at Ignite their conference for um, their partners in November. I think both will lay out a vision for this transition to armies of agents as opposed to all the um, sort of simmering activity we've we've heard about single agents out of the ecosystem. And this is so much more than retrieval or augmented generation. This is where these agents work, do work on, uh, on behalf of a human supervisor. They learn it over time and they cooperate with other agents to solve complex tasks by building on uh, simple capabilities that each of them simple expertise that each of them has. And crucially, it builds on all the work on all the enterprise software that's come before. And to be very explicit, what's in symbolic software, traditional software is what needs to be repeatable, precise, accurate, what can be specified. Think of it as like Newtonian mechanics. Whereas what's in the agent AI is all the long tail or dark matter of activity that you couldn't capture in these Newtonian rules, but you could only learn bottom up and they have to coexist. And what's not clear yet is exactly where that layer of coexistence um, comes from because in the Newtonian world, you're still gonna wanna align all your activity with very precise and repeatable um, analytics. But at the same time, you're gonna wanna align the activity of your agents, but that's gonna be a very different mechanism. And so that's a, that, that where those two alignment um, technologies come together. How do I align the Newtonian activities? How do I align the agent, agentic activities? That's, I think, the biggest open question. Now, the key point is um, it does not make the data platform less relevant, it actually will make it and the layer um, that it needs to grow into more important. What's not clear yet though, is who's gonna um, innovate and create that that layer, um, that layer above the data platform that harmonizes it. So last point, 
agents are going to be the shiny new toy that captures everyone's attention, um, especially armies of agent and the framework that aligns them. But they really, really need um, a harmonized estate underneath to make them work and make them sing. Got it. Okay, good. Let's let's bring in some of the ETR data and in 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 this chart here we cherry pick a number of enterprise application and data platform firms. The data shows net score on the vertical axis and penetration or overlap in in the data set on the on the x axis. As this is more than 1700 accounts that we're surveying here with ETR. Net score is a measure of spending velocity on a platform. You see Salesforce has a dominant presence uh, as does ServiceNow. OpenAI continues to lead virtually all companies in terms of net score in the enterprise. Uh, Snowflake is also prominent. Databricks has momentum, as you can see in the vertical axis, Google Workspace and SAP are comparably positioned. And we also show Microsoft's uh, Power Platform as, as a representative uh, platform. The, what's in the data set is just very narrow RPA, but we're using it as a sort of, as a metaphor for the larger Power Platform. We're also showing a pack of Workday Salesforce's MuleSoft, which is very strategic, UiPath NetSuite, uh, which is Oracle, and also Oracle Fusion, and also IBM Watson, which we think is you know got a play here, Palantir, which George referenced earlier, as well as Salonis, and then Infor for context, another sort of legacy application company to which there are going to be connections. George, maybe you can comment on some of these names and what you see as their aspirations. Anything stand out about how they're approaching the market and their role in agentic systems? Yeah, each each has a a, a different um, approach. You know, the one thing to call out that's really interesting is the open AIs, the frontier models like open AI, Gemini, Anthropic, um, they're all trying to build general purpose agents with these um, sort of open-ended reasoning and planning capabilities. And that's why we did that earlier um, uh, breaking analysis, uh, maybe a month or so ago about agents where we said those building these open-ended consumer ones are are like um, adventure adventurous sailors in the in the Middle Ages who are potentially you know sailing off into into the end of the earth and will fall off the end of a flat earth. It's a very open-ended, difficult problem. Whereas you take someone like um, Salesforce or Microsoft, and their agents just look at um, a, a, a small piece of a well-defined map of the enterprise. And they know it's it's not an open-ended search and navigation problem. It's a, you know, I have a choice of half a dozen things I might be able to do, and I can mix and match how I get them done. It's a much more tractable tractable problem. So, so there's a little bit of mix and match uh, apples to oranges on this chart. And I th the, I think the point is it's like 25 years ago. First we had B to C um, commerce try and take off, but it was such a general purpose problem that the B2B had a smaller number of, of customers with much more well-defined um, uh, sort of activities. And that, that really took off first, um, or it took off in a much more meaning, meaningful way. And similarly, I think the, these enterprise agents are going to be um, much more mature, much faster, and just really quickly. So Palantir has built a really a mature foundation across largely the legacy transactional systems in the enterprise. Salonis learns the capabilities across your different business systems bottom up by reading the logs and understanding what's going on. Um, UiPath um, has the opportunity to uh, learn both from APIs and screens. Um, so you can get to legacy apps that don't even have APIs our platform has 1,400 connectors. They're not semantically harmonized yet, but they have the richest um, and easiest to use tools to make it easy to build um, armies of agents. They don't yet have the agent control framework for armies of agents, but I think we'll see that this fall. And I think we'll see Salesforce put all the pieces together, at least for working in the context of Salesforce um, next month. 
So that's, you'll, you'll start to see the different approaches getting most of, or some or, or most of the pieces, no one's gonna have all the pieces right. Well, the, the really interesting dynamic where you have the existing application vendors who really have a, a data locked in, they own the, the business logic, they're you know, attacking this problem and you've got, as you mentioned, the Salonises and, and, and UiPaths of the world trying to build a horizontal capability across the apps and that's gonna be an interesting dynamic. But uh, as you say, there's not gonna be one agentic system to rule them all. All right, let's close. Hopefully that, that architecture that George you know, developed and made a picture of you know, helps at least sort of build a mental model of how that's all gonna work. Let's close by looking at how the trend toward agentic systems is gonna evolve, maybe some of the key milestones that we're looking for over time. Um, as we emphasized, it's really important. You gotta connect back to the legacy data it, and great point that you made about whether or not they have a UI. Um, we may be able to, we will be able to get to them uh, despite the, the lack of a, of a user interface or a GUI. Um, it, it, you've got existing ISVs, you've got automation firms that we just sort of laid out uh, that dynamic. Today's modern data platforms, you know, they're no longer considered so modern. Modern is kind of getting long in the tooth. They're opening up. Um, the open table formats like Iceberg are, are becoming you know, more prominent, uh, but people don't quite understand yet how to govern those table formats. So it's likely that we're gonna have multiple um, governance platforms and mul multiple table formats and you know, work has to be done to bring those, those together. The federated model, you know, Jamak Tagani's vision of a data mesh is taking a long time to to evolve and only the, really the largest companies out there are pursuing in earnest data mesh and there's they're they're running into some gaps which is why she started a company to try to address this um, but that's again a, a next step here governance as we say big wild card and it's going to take a long time to to sort that out this idea of of fully harmonized data and the full capability around application semantics semantics, um, that's probably going to even take longer as metadata, you know, has to, you have to have a unified metadata layer. You think about all the data that's inside of Amazon. Um, you've got metadata for data zones. You've got metadata for glue. You've got multiple different data stores. And so we expect at reInvent, we're at least going to hear something in that direction. You know, Amazon, you know, usually comes around and, you know, pays attention to what customers need. And I'm sure their customers are saying, hey, you've got to help us you know, simplify and unify so we can start building intelligent apps, which is clearly something that AWS wants to be able to do, you know, like Microsoft is is doing and, you know, Google with its workspace, you know, has a leg up there in SaaS. So we'll be watching for that. Multi-agent um, orchestration um, has got to emerge. Uh, that's, a, as we said, a big valuable piece of real estate. It's got to have the intelligence to interpret uh, those metrics that George showed in the upper left. Um, and that's going to take some time to emerge. And so as we enter the 2030s, this idea that we laid out, you know, a year and a half ago of Uber for all, a digital represented representation of the enterprise, people, places, and things, uh, things that databases understand, i.e. strings, turning them into things that humans understand, um, will emerge. Uh, that is going to drive a dramatic improvement in organizational productivity and response times because the, the vision is this is done in real time. But George, we'll give you the final word. Great work today. Well, thanks, Dave. Always um, a pleasure to work with you because kind of I think we pushed each other to bring our stories up to a different level. Um, I do say this is a profoundly impactful transition um, just to sort of look back 12 months, 18 months, access to open AI helped pull along m many Azure services such as Fabric. Um, but now I think we're going to see low code, no code agent building tools designed for corporate developers as opposed to pro devs and the agent control frameworks as the way to bundle an entire application construction stack. So I think we're gonna see um, going into next year, really Salesforce and Microsoft um, leading um, all, 
leading sales to their enterprises, not with individual products, but the tip of the spear, the bundle, the entire bundle will be held together by um, here's how you can um, extend our stack in a way that's accessible to corporate developers. And it all holds together. I, th I think that's going to be um, uh, a very, very big transition. In other words, the the cloud platform for corporate developers is going to be the tip of the spear is going to be this agent framework. Um, and I think we're going to have to see uh, AWS and, and Google play catch up here. And the data platform vendors, their products will play a critical role. Uh, role. They have the source of truth, but they have to move up to the harmonization layer if they don't want to be enveloped in the platform world. Envelopment is the competitive dynamic because if that happens, they lose some of their differentiation and pricing power when the layer above, which if it's a new harmonization vendor, can decide which of their features to adopt. Awesome segment, George. Really appreciate uh, your time and your contribution as always. Okay, that's it for now. I want to thank Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production, and they do our podcast as well. Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight help get the word out on social media and in our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Remember, all these episodes, they're available as podcasts. You can pop in the headphones and take a walk. Just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. Listen, wherever you get your podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me if you have some ideas for sessions or guests at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn posts and check out etr.ai. Some amazing survey work that they've done. Best survey work in the enterprise tech business in my view. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.